In 1955, a book by reading expert Rudolf Flesch captured the nation's attention. This book, called Why Johnny Can't Read, argued that the American schools were using a completely ineffective approach to reading instruction, which left many children completely helpless when it came to reading. We're almost 70 years after that time today, and unfortunately, the state of reading education in American schools is still abysmal. The federal government administers a reading test every few years called the National Assessment of Educational Progress. In 2019, this test found that 65% of U.S. fourth graders scored below the level of proficient. 65%. A lot has gone on in reading education for the last nearly 70 years, but one central aspect is this. Despite decades of campaigns by parents, reading experts, scientists, concerned citizens, despite a large and growing body of empirical evidence showing what works and what doesn't, and despite even laws passed in many states, many public school classrooms still use disastrously bad reading methods. What is the situation today and why? Why has it been so hard to get American schools to consistently get this right? That's what I want to talk about today. Because reading is perhaps the most important skill in education. It's the skill that gives students access to the rest of the vast world of conceptual knowledge. It's the foundation that makes education possible. The fact that schools can't get this right, are performing so poorly in this area, has massive consequences on all of education, on any subject that you could care about. To say nothing of the disastrous consequences on the lives of children who are left unable to read very well. It's also not a great mystery how reading should be taught. There are legitimate questions and debates about some of the more specific aspects of how to teach it, but when it comes to the question of what general approach should be used, the answer is very clear and there's a lot of evidence for it. So the story of how schools continue to struggle with this can serve as an alarming case study that indicates problems that are going on in education more generally. So I want to start today by briefly describing what a proper approach needs to involve and looking at the state of modern schools in comparison to that proper approach. Then I want to talk about two key moments in the last 70 years of the reading wars, as they're called. Two moments when it seemed like the right methods might win, and then they didn't. Irrational methods survived. I want to do this so that we can see how the educational establishment and the ideas about education that pervade it continue to encourage the adoption and preservation of bad approaches to reading. Finally, I want to say something about the state of things right now today and talk about the movement in favor of appropriate reading methods as it stands right now and say something about what it gets right and what I think it is still lacking to be fully effective. So let's start with the basics. To tell you about reading, I need to say something about the relationship between written language and spoken language. Spoken language comes first. It comes first historically by a lot, right? There are people were speaking for a long time before anyone started writing. And it comes first in the development of each child, each person, right? We all learn how to speak before we learn how to read and write. And that's important. Written language is a code that represents spoken language. It represents the language that we speak in a visual form. And it's really valuable that we can do this. It enables us to preserve information, preserve language. It enables us to uh, convey messages across time and space. But the way that it does this is by acting as a code for spoken language. Now, if you're a pretty capable reader, as I imagine almost all of you are, 
you're able to translate that code very quickly, very easily. You don't have to consciously do it. You just look at a piece of text and you do it automatically because you've automatized the skill of doing that. But grasping the relationship between written language and spoken language is an achievement. It was a momentous achievement for the unknown people who invented writing, but it's also an achievement for each individual who learns to understand the written code and to relate it to spoken language. Specifically, it's an achievement of conceptual thinking. Let me explain. Think about how many words we have in any language. Think about English, how many words there are. The average native speaker has vocabulary at least in the tens of thousands. And in an unabridged dictionary, you'll find hundreds of thousands of words. What would our writing system look like if we decided to have one unique symbol for each word in our language? It would be impossible to learn how to read. There would be way too many symbols. We could never remember them all. You'd have to memorize them one by one. Whenever you encountered a new word, you'd be helpless until you learned what symbol corresponds with what spoken word. It wouldn't work. Our writing system is made possible by a conceptual achievement, which is the recognition of the fact that words can be broken down into units of sound, and that each language is built out of a relatively small number of such units. In, uh, in these units of sound, the smallest type of unit is it's called the phoneme. It's like a single individual sound. I'll give an example. If you think about the word cat, there are three phonemes in that. K, A, T. All the words in our language can be broken down into their phonemes, even longer and more complicated words that have much more than three phonemes. For example, you can break philosophy into f, i, l, a, s, o, f, e. Breaking words down into phonemes, isolating them through a process of abstraction, recognizing that these are the components of the words that sound like one whole unit to us, enables us to have a writing system because we can assign a symbol for a phoneme and use that whenever that phoneme is used. And if we can learn how to recognize those symbols, match them up to the corresponding sound and piece those together into the words, then we can write and read thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of words using a few dozen symbols. And this of course is what our written language does. But this only works so long as you actually have this conceptual knowledge, so long as you're actually able to break the words into their component sounds, recognize that these sounds are parts of the word, so long as you know how the sound corresponds to the symbol, and so long as you know how to take these sounds that you've gotten from reading uh, the symbols off the page and combine them now back into the words. Now, this conceptual body of knowledge, a small minority of children actually figure this out on their own. They don't need to be taught. You may know somebody, or you may yourself be somebody who did this, but the significant majority of people need to be taught this. They need somebody to help them learn this body of knowledge. And if they aren't taught it, they won't learn it. What they need to be taught is what is basically called phonics. That's a good shorthand for these kind of learning the division of words into phonemes, learning the sound and letter correspondences, and learning how to blend sounds that you've read off the page into the words. These are the basic essentials of a proper reading method. There's a lot more particulars that we can get into, and you can ask me about some of those. But now I want to look at the American schools today. Because you might think, surely the schools would do this, would teach this knowledge. I mean, once you think about how language works, it seems pretty clear this is what you need to know. Um, 
we've all kind of had the experience of encountering a written word that we don't know and sounding it out. So that seems like a good thing to know how to do. Uh, and you may even have heard about, oh, like this state has passed a law requiring the teaching of phonics, or there's this new initiative about phonics. So you might think this is surely what the American schools are doing today. Is it? The answer is kind of yes and no, but it's very mixed on that, uh, on the yes side of that. A significant number of teachers do teach reading this way. It's about one-fifth, uh, according to a, a survey by Education Week, which is a, a major publication in the field of education. They did a survey in 2019 of kindergarten to second grade teachers in the U.S. Um, now, this is a survey of self-reports, so there's, it's, you have to you know, interpret what the teachers are saying about themselves. Um, and this is a few years old, so there's, for reasons I'll get into, it may have moved in a bit of a better direction. But this survey is some of the best evidence we have about what goes on in the classroom, and it gives a pretty good general representation of what's going on. So in this survey, 22% of teachers said they teach explicit systematic phonics. Now, we could go in more detail about what that looks like and what different methods under that are, but basically it means they teach phonics consistently, they treat it as the way that you decode words, and they teach the major sound and letter correspondences in English in a sequence and help the children blend those sounds together into words. There are different ways of doing this, some better, some worse, uh, but this is the right general approach to pursue, and we have 22% at least say that they're doing that. So what of the other 78% of teachers? What are they doing? Now, many of them also teach some phonics. It's at least a part of what they do, but it's not really clear how many of them are teaching it systematically or encouraging children to actually use it when they are faced with a book that they're trying to read. And many of them are teaching phonics in combination with a popular method that is antithetical to this conceptual approach to reading. This popular method is something that's called three cueing. That's Q as in an actor's cue, C-U-E. Essentially, the way three cueing works is this. Say a child is trying to read something. He's making his way through, he's recognizing some of the words. Maybe he's memorized some of these words, maybe he's learned some phonics that has enabled him to, to sound out some of the words. In any case, at a certain point, he'll come across a word that he doesn't immediately recognize. What is he supposed to do when that happens? The three cueing method says you shouldn't try to sound it out and learn your letter and sound correspondences. It says that you should use three cues to try to figure out what this word could be. So the first cue is what's called a meaning cue. You're supposed to use your uh, sense of what this thing is supposed to mean, the whole sentence, to try to figure out what the missing word is. Now with children's books, what this usually amounts to is looking at the picture, right? If you have a sentence, say the sentence says, see the dog run, and the child is not able to recognize that last word, run, and there's a picture showing a dog running, the idea is that you're supposed to, you know, look at the picture and try to figure out that that's the word that's, that's missing. So that's one type of cue. You can notice ways already in which that could go wrong. What if it's a a brown dog, what if the dog is also carrying a tennis ball? There might be some issues. The second type of cues are context. So does the word make sense when you say it in the sentence? If the dog is brown, the child might at first think, well, maybe the word is brown, but when you say see the dog brown, doesn't, doesn't really make sense in the sentence. So that's supposed to be another way to try to figure out what is this word. And then finally, there's the third cue, which is, okay, you can look at the letters. We're not going to sound them all out, but maybe the first letter or the second, like a couple of the letters, can we correspond those to some of the words that you've already thought about using the other cues? 
Okay, so that's three queuing. And I can guess what some of you are probably thinking right now, which is, isn't that just guessing? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. Uh, three queuing is a way of teaching children to identify words, identify words, not by looking at the letters and the sounds and what they actually consist of, but by using other stuff to try to guess what the word is. So this is a bizarre approach. It's not even really a method of reading. Uh, and what we'll see is that it really comes from a whole view of reading, a whole idea about reading that is totally anti-conceptual in its entire approach and its entire idea about how reading works. So three queuing, it was in peak popularity in the 90s, definitely still around today though. About 40% uh, of teachers in that survey I mentioned before tell their students when they encounter a word they don't know that they should either use the picture or the context first. That's the first step. And 75% say they have taught three queuing in some form or another. Now, that 75% say they teach three queuing. 70% of teachers in that survey also say they teach phonics. They, didn't, they don't say explicit systematic phonics, but they say they teach phonics. So what we have is 75% three queuing, 70% phonics. Clearly what that indicates is that there are a lot of teachers who teach a mixture of these two methods. They teach some letter sounds and maybe sounding out. They teach some guessing. This might seem strange, but it's the norm in a lot of places in America today. I'll note that this probably varies state to state and locality to locality, but in a lot of America, this is the kind of thing that you can expect to see in an elementary school. So the children are being taught two contradictory methods. What are they supposed to do when they're reading? When are you supposed to sound out a word? And when are you supposed to look at the picture? They aren't really given any clear answers. But what is clear is the effect that this has on children who are taught this way. Uh, the education journalist Emily Hanford did a whole podcast series called Sold a Story, where she talked to a lot of parents uh, and children who had undergone this instruction. Uh, one example that came up is a, a boy who was in a, one of these balanced programs where they do some phonics, they do some three cueing, it's mixed together. Uh, and what this parent noticed about her son was that he was memorizing all the books that he was given in school. He could confidently read a book if he had seen it already and read it before, but if you gave him something new that he never read, he really struggled. He couldn't really read it. So this is the kind of thing that happens when children are faced with this mishmash of approaches. They are left in this helpless state where they adopt ideas like, okay, I'm just going to try to memorize everything. So this boy, by the way, was told by his teachers or his parents were told by the teachers that he was doing really well in reading. He was, he was right on track, even though he wasn't really reading much, if at all. So why has it been so hard to get schools to get this right? Why do they not adopt phonics consistently? Why do methods like three queuing stay in place? And why do we have such a hodgepodge going on today? Well, so now let's take a look at what's happened the last couple of times that there's been a lot of public pressure on the schools to make changes. The first came in the 1950s and 60s. Rudolf Flesch kicked that off. So I'll talk about that first, and then I'll turn to what happened in the 90s and 2000s uh, during another kind of reading wars period. So in the 50s and 60s, the dominant approach of reading uh, was this idea of, you may have heard it called look say, the idea that children memorize whole words and that's how you should learn to read. Um, this was what Rudolf Flesch took on. He challenged uh, this and said, this is, this is all wrong. Uh, this idea that you should memorize whole words as though each one is a new a uh, brand new thing coming before you that has no relation to the previous words that instead of learning the letters that make up all the words in our language, 
This is, of course, a, an anti-conceptual approach, and you may have read some of the works that Ayn Rand or Leonard Peikoff have written criticizing this approach to reading as anti-conceptual. Um, this idea was taking a lot of heat in the, in the 50s and 60s, thanks to Flesh and some others. Uh, there was a lot of research starting to happen about how this does not really work. Um, in other words, the advocates of this anti-conceptual reading method were sort of on their heels. They were taking a lot of criticism. They were under a lot of pressure to make changes. You might have thought, okay, they're going to answer. They're going to accept the criticism and make some changes. But this really wasn't the end. It was only the beginning of a new phase. Even as the evidence in favor of phonics was starting to really mount, educational theorists were introducing a new method, a new method called whole language. And this was called new, but it wasn't really that new. It was based on the same premises as the previous method, just a different version of it, and in a way, a more openly and avowedly irrational version. What is whole language? Well, here's the idea. The idea is basically that children learn how to read naturally. They just have to sort of experience written language, and they'll figure it out at some point. The job of the teacher is to provide them with a lot of authentic texts and a lot of just children's books around the classroom, to read to them a lot and kind of be a model reader, and to provide some occasional tips, maybe including some stray phonics lessons, but certainly not a systematic phonics curriculum. And at some point, the children will just start figuring it out. They'll figure out how to read. Now, as I mentioned, a minority, a pretty small minority of children actually do figure out reading on their own. It's not by some sort of kind of magical process. It's that they just figure out on their own the things that other children need to be taught. But again, that's a minority. The vast majority need to be taught this knowledge about how written language works. And so to not teach them, that's, a, that's flying in the face of the needs of these children's minds. It's denying them the conceptual knowledge that they need. It's another anti-conceptual approach. You're ignoring the fact that language works on a system of abstract knowledge, understanding the sounds in language and their correspondence to letters, in favor of saying, just look at the, the whole language, just look at this whole text, and you'll work it out. So in a way, you see that look-say is, is an approach that's based on some idea about how reading works that isn't very good. It's you learn whole words one at a time, memorize them. But it gives the teacher some guidance of like, teach reading this way. It's a really bad way, but it's a way of teaching. Whole language almost comes down to don't do much teaching at all. It'll just work itself out. So what is the theory here? How is this actually supposed to work? How are children actually supposed to get anything, uh, learn reading for whole language? Well, one of the founders of the movement, Ken Goodman, introduced his view of reading in a 1967 paper. He said that no one actually reads every letter and every word precisely. Instead, what we do is we cobble together various clues or cues that we happen to see, including what we anticipate the meaning of something to be. We use context of some words to figure out other words. And we look at the letters some, but we certainly don't actually like read them all. This was his view of how reading works, not just for children, but for all of us. That's what he thought we all do. And in case you didn't think he was serious, he titled that paper, Reading a psycholinguistic guessing game. He's completely serious about that. This idea, as you can, may have gathered, is the basis for the three cueing method. It's that, the idea that we use these different clues to piece together what the words are. That's the basis for this idea that children should look at the picture and use the context and look at a few of the letters, and that's how you figure out what the word is. Now, the whole language movement, strange as it may sound to you, took the education world by storm. It really took off. Goodman and the other theorists of this movement took their ideas to teachers, to school administrators, to professors of education, and by and large, they loved it. By the 1990s, whole language was 
really everywhere in the United States. It was really, really popular. So why did this take off? How could this take off? Well, one place we might look is there, there are a few arguments people give that they try to make it sound plausible that this could work. They say things like, well, you know, you don't have to teach children how to speak. You, they just need to be around people who can speak and they'll figure it out on their own. We don't have to, you know, you don't give speaking lessons to a one-year-old. So why can't reading work the same way? That's one. The other is, well, this is more of an English-specific one. Well, you look at English. All the sound and letter correspondences is so complicated. There are so many rules. It's not obvious when this one applies and that one applies. There's a bunch of exceptions. It's, it's so confusing. Like, why even bother with that? Uh, just, just use all these cues and that'll be easier. But these arguments aren't really good enough to explain why this would take off. I mean, for one thing, if you understand a little about language and about conceptual thought, they're not that hard to answer. I, it's, it's not that difficult to think about, like, okay, just because there are some exceptions doesn't mean that it's not really valuable to learn the rules and understand how most of written language works. Or to be able to say something like, uh, yeah, uh, speaking and writing are totally different. They don't work the same way. There's a bunch of knowledge that you need to know about this code and, and how it works in order to understand writing that doesn't apply with speech. So what ha happened? How did this take off? Well, there's a deeper reason why this approach was so popular, so successful. And that's because it appealed to ideas that have long been pretty popular in the field of education and were particularly popular at the time when this was starting to come onto the scene. Most crucially, it was built on the idea that uh, teaching conceptual knowledge is uh, imposing on children. It's even like authoritarian, people would say. The idea was instead that children should learn naturally. They should have some experiences and construct their own knowledge. The teacher stepping in and teaching all of these kind of abstract pieces of knowledge that bring rational order to the children's knowledge and help them to understand reality, all of that is an imposition. It's, it's too much. They don't need it, and it's, you're sort of clipping their wings. Of course, this view relies on the invalid use of several concepts. I mean, the most egregious is that authoritarianism term. I mean, that's a really pretty serious package deal, uh, saying that a knowledgeable person imparting knowledge to someone who doesn't know something is like a dictator using force to make people obey his orders. I mean, that's reason and force being package dealt together there. And in, it makes it even worse when you consider what Ayn Rand wrote about in the Comprachicos, that when children don't develop their conceptual knowledge, when they don't learn how to you know, understand the world in conceptual terms, it makes them vulnerable. It makes them you know, much more willing to accept authoritarian rule. So it's quite two opposite things being packaged. Um, the other, there are some other invalid uses of concepts there as well. I mean, the idea of constructing knowledge, that that's something that is done, it takes a, a true claim, which is that learning actually requires first-handed thinking, and it, it's you're not like a passive receptacle of knowledge. You have to use your own mind to acquire knowledge. But it takes that and claims that that means that uh, anybody's constructs are as good as anybody else's constructs. So it, it, it takes a subjectivist slant on how knowledge works. And the idea of natural learning here, it doesn't mean in accordance with the requirements of the child's nature or the mind. It means more like spontaneously, without rational guidance, somehow. So the implication of this view is that abstract knowledge isn't a means of objectively identifying facts. It, instead, that abstractions are something that people come up with as their own subjective right. Sorry, their own subjective way of viewing the world. And that the wrong thing to do is to impose your own abstract understanding on other people by saying, these are true, these are false. 
And we can see this idea in other places today, by the way, as you may have thought. Of course, these ideas, not everyone takes them fully seriously in education. They're kind of hard to take fully seriously. But to the extent that people view learning this way, uh, they, are, they increasingly are suspicious of teaching abstract knowledge in reading and in, and in other aspects of education. And they become much more inclined to believe in things like whole language. They're going to just learn to read naturally. Your teacher doesn't need to impose on them. They'll construct their own understanding of how to deal with words. Don't worry about it. That's the, that's the way to go. Don't impose. So despite its illogic, the whole language movement caught on, was really successful, and uh, became one of the, probably the dominant method in the, by the 1990s, it was definitely the dominant method in the US uh, because of its appeal to a particular view of education. Now, people caught on that this was happening, that it wasn't working, that the consequences were disastrous in the 90s and 2000s. Again, there were campaigns saying, no, get rid of this stuff, you need to teach phonics. By this time, there was also a lot more research on the consequences of different types of reading programs. In 2000, there was a report by the National Reading Panel that uh, synthesized about uh, 38 different studies that showed very clearly that phonics works much better than other methods of teaching reading. And based on this research, this new movement was calling for people to calling for schools to change, to teach phonics, to discard the methods that weren't working. There were even some laws passed at this time. So once again, surely this was it, right? Enter balanced literacy. The advocates of whole language did not surrender. They just regrouped, rebranded, made a few concessions. The idea of balanced literacy it's sort of like the idea of a mixed economy, right? Mixed economy is a mixture of freedom and statism in some proportion. Balanced literacy is a mixture of phonics and whole language methods in some proportion, somehow. It, that's the mishmash that we have today in a lot of places, is this compromised position of balanced literacy. Now, some of the practitioners, they might be more on the phonics side, but most of them I think there's reason to be suspicious, especially because the original pioneers of the balanced literacy idea were the same whole language advocates from the previous era who simply rebranded. They added a little bit more phonics into their program as a concession to governments and parents and kept doing their same basic approach just as they were before. So again, things didn't really change. Why? Well, the educational establishment didn't change its basic views on education. It remained kind of as this stale orthodoxy of these old ideas about uh, constructing knowledge and suspicious of abstract teaching. And so people were resistant to adopting a more rational approach that would involve conceptual type of teaching. And by the way, I must mention at this point that it's really important that this is a government-sponsored, government-created establishment, right? That there's this sort of nexus of public schools, uh, university colleges of education, uh, administrators, school boards, all of this stuff, which is all in, this, in the context of a government-controlled system where there's not competition, people really aren't free to create their own alternatives. Um, and I think it's really interesting. You can read uh, Ayn Rand's essay, Establishing of an Establishment, where she talks about how as government force enters into an intellectual realm, uh, alternatives become sparse um, and you get a sort of concentration of a stale orthodoxy. So whole language practitioners kept their methods. The methods survived to this day just by changing and rebranding uh, because they weren't challenged on their fundamentals because the educational establishment remained in place, didn't fundamentally change, didn't have its ideas, its basic premises about education challenged. And that brings us up to the last few years. 
And I want to say something in our, just briefly in our last few minutes about where the debate stands today. So whole language methods have not gone away. Uh, they've continued to be really popular, used in a lot of schools under the heading of balanced literacy. Uh, but recently, there's been renewed attention to the reading issue, this time more focused on, okay, we've said you need to do phonics, and now you say that you do phonics, which is a typical refrain, right, is like, dear school board, you need to teach phonics. We do teach phonics, but what they mean is that they teach it in the context of some other methods in this sort of mixed system. That's a lot of the time what they mean, at least. Uh, Today, there's renewed attention of, no, you have to have a consistent pro-phonics approach. You can't have this mishmash. And uh, in large part, this attention has uh, been brought by what's called the science of reading movement. And the science of reading movement is, is led by uh, cognitive scientists who have done a lot of research on how reading works. They've done research on you know, kind of the empirical, what methods work, what methods produce good results type of work. They've also started looking more into how uh, the kind of finer details of reading work. And they've had some positive impact on the state of reading education in the US. Uh, they've been really good at articulating the evidence for phonics in a way that's pretty accessible to ordinary people and, and to teachers. Uh, they're clear about how strong the evidence is, and they can say a little bit about why you need to adopt phonics and adopt it consistently. Uh, this has enabled them to persuade some educators, particularly those educators who haven't fully bought into the orthodoxy that dominates their field, uh, the ones who are a little bit more on the fence, the ones who really care about their students and have may have had lingering doubts for years about the methods that they've been using. And uh, when they hear from the science of reading movement, they are sometimes convinced uh, that they need to change their ways. Now, I, I can say more about this if you want to ask me a question about it, but one thing you might ask is, how is it not obvious that whole language is a, a failure? Um, whole language methods sometimes uh, can be tricky because stuff like three queuing teaches children to basically do something that looks like reading but isn't. It's like training in how to kind of act like you're reading. Um, and so the children, of course, who are totally innocent, they think that, that what their teacher is telling them reading is, is what they're doing. Uh, but what they're being taught is sort of how to fake it. Um, and some of them develop pretty good ways of convincing people that they're reading. So that's one of the reasons why it's not immediately apparent to teachers that things are going wrong, although there are usually some warning signs. And I can talk about others as well. So some teachers are convinced by the science of reading movement. It's not clear how many, but you can hear some testimonials in the Emily Hanford podcast I mentioned and, and elsewhere. There are teachers who are saying, oh, like I feel really bad about what I did. They're indignant at the people who taught them these bad methods or encouraged them to use them. And they credit the science of reading movement with showing them the evidence and explaining why they needed to change their ways. So that's a good thing. That's a good step. Um, the science of reading movement also brings to light something that I, I want to add as a piece of context for my own presentation as well, which is that phonics is an important, it is the necessary beginning of learning to read, but it is not the be-all, end-all of reading. In other words, if you just know phonics, nothing else, if a, a failing American school today adopted phonics and didn't change anything else in its curriculum, there would still be a lot of problems. The science of reading movement in particular has really emphasized the importance of general knowledge and the importance of grammar. And these really come in when it comes to comprehension, which is the next stage after decoding. If you're able to translate the words on a page into words that you can speak, that's necessary and that's an important first step. But if you don't know what the words mean, if you have no idea what this you know, piece of writing is talking about, if you don't know how to make sense of the structure of a complex sentence, you can't read advanced adult language. So these are two good things that the science of reading movement has advanced. 
Where I think it falls a little short, though, is that they don't sufficiently recognize the role of ideas, the role of the view of education that I talked about earlier in keeping the whole language methods alive. They're aware that these ideas are out there, and they, I think the science of reading people are often kind of confused about this. Like They know that teachers, a lot of them believe these things, but their, their response is sort of like, come on, the science says it doesn't work. You should follow what, this, what is scientifically proven. But what they're missing is that people are moved not primarily by sort of evidence of what produces practical results, right? They're, they're moved by their ideas about what's right and wrong. And so if you really believe that a certain approach is morally the right way to teach children, and you believe that another approach is authoritarian, well, then that's going to make it hard to convince you to change your ways. So the science of reading movement, they're good at making the, the case of how phonics works and why, but they need more philosophical ammunition. To really win the reading, the reading wars, what we need to do is to challenge the basic premises in the educational establishment, to really articulate a view of education that emphasizes the role of learning abstract conceptual knowledge. The, the fact that conceptual knowledge is connected to reality, it can be objective, it can be true, and that it's a necessary part of a child's intellectual development. This will involve going beyond just the area of reading to talking about a more general approach to education, a conceptual approach. But this is what we need to do in order to win this, and we need to help arm the best of the science of reading advocates to make this case as well. Finally, we need to recognize that the reading wars are a moral issue. It's an issue not just about, hey, is this theory true or is that theory true? It's an issue about whether children will be condemned to struggle to read, to resignation when they can't do it very well, potentially for life or whether they're empowered to enter the world that written language opens up to us, to enter the sphere of human knowledge and, and you know, interact with the great minds of history, read and study history, science, philosophy, literature, and to enjoy all the life experiences that that makes possible. That's what the reading wars are really about, and that's why they, they must be won. Thank you. Uh, as you know, some languages are more phonetic than others. For example, Spanish and Russian are very close to having a one-to-one -one correspondence between sounds and letters, whereas, for example, English or Polish um, have many exceptions. Um, and my own experience has been learning to read Russian first, since it was phonetic. I learned it easily, and then I could transfer that to my first spoken language, which was Polish, and that worked very well for me. Um, now, Spanish, which is widespread, uh, yes. Would it make sense to teach kids to read Spanish first? Uh, I mean, I think it, if a child was already being raised bilingual and speaking both English and Spanish, I can see a, a case for that. It, Spanish is a much easier set of sound and letter correspondences. And so if a child is already like knows how to speak both those languages, learning Spanish might be a step that helps them unlock that basic insight and then they can learn uh, the more complicated English system. Um, but I think it still matter like whether the child actually knows how to speak Spanish. Uh, if, if they don't, I don't, I'm not sure it would help. And even though English is a complicated system, it's still something that you can learn. If you, it takes a little longer than some other languages, but you can still definitely learn it. And so I don't think uh, it, it's, uh, it's not an insurmountable obstacle, the, the English system. Uh, can you recommend any uh, books, lectures, anything about phonetics of English? 
Uh, sorry, what was the last part? Uh, can you recommend any books, lectures, anything about the phonetics of English? The phonics of English. Yes. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot that, it, it depends on from what perspective you want to learn it. So I think it's very interesting and valuable to learn the kind of the linguistics, at least some of the, the basics of it. And there, I think uh, John McWhorter is a linguist who's done a lot of good work kind of popularizing the basics of how English works. Um, if you're looking more into like phonics and how reading works, um, one good resource that gets in, that's more on the science of reading side and can get into the weeds a little bit, but gives a pretty good primer is a book called Language at the Speed of Sight by Mark Seidenberg. That's S-E-I-D-E-N-B-E-R-G. Uh, it occurs to me that there may be a specific epistemological reason why people are opposed to phonics. And that is very few of these people have read Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, perhaps zero, and they don't know the file, file folder analogy, it's very valuable that Ayn Rand gives, that tell, tells you that the knowledge, are of a, uh, your knowledge is filed in a, a conceptual folder and is accessed that way. So they don't realize that when you decode a word, you can immediately access knowledge of the concept. And they, they're thinking, we have to guess to get the meaning. That's what I think that may be what some of them think. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, certainly an introduction to objectivist epistemology has a lot to say about this. And uh, it'd be, be helpful to uh, you know, use some of those insights to make it clear why it's valuable to learn the learn uh, phonics conceptually. On the specific issue of why whole language people want to guess the word is that they do have a view that's sort of like, who cares about all this phonics stuff? We got to get directly to the meaning. Like we just, they need to just get to the meaning, skip all the like letter stuff. And it's a bizarre view that I, I don't, quite know how to explain, but it definitely is that they, definitely an important part of it is that they don't understand how how conceptual knowledge works. And they, they think that you can just divine the meaning from a text without any method. To what extent do things like the three queuing method gain plausibility from mixing up the behavior of mature experienced adult readers with the behavior of children just learning to read. Because um, I yeah. think when I read, I'm not sounding out every word. I do recognize a lot of things just from familiarity and, uh, you know, I fit words together and integrate them into sentences by meaning and so on. But I wouldn't expect a, a child to be doing that. Yeah, I think they, they get a lot of plausibility from that. I mean, there's the fact that reading is something that literate adults have automatized and that you just you, you look at it and you just go along and you know what it means that's only the result of course of years of learning and practice and now you've automatized it but yeah there's claims that you can see in some of the whole language writers that it's like well really what reading is is that you just sort of it's like you're looking through the text and that you see the meaning and they don't recognize that that's an achievement uh, and they say, like, well, we just need to get children, like, we need to help them look through the text. But they, there's no explanation of how that's done. Uh, I'll also add, because I think this is interesting, is that the, the queuing idea, a lot of how the people like Ken Goodman say they arrived at it, is that they study children who are actually reading stuff out loud and tried to study what their mistakes were. Although they wouldn't say mistakes because that's, that's too normative. They would say miscues. Uh, and tried to piece that together into a theory of how reading works. And one of the results of this is that they wound up coming up with an idea of how strong readers read things that is actually an, a fairly accurate description of how children who are really struggling to read try to hide the fact that they're struggling. Um, you touched on this a little. I know that rote memorization is a big part of public education, but I've only ever thought of it as a limitation that, you know, education places on students who are already capable 
Do you think the fact that there's these alternative methods of reading being taught other than phonics sets students up to only be susceptible to rote memorization like later on in education? Like, in, do you mean like in secondary education? Yeah. You know, I don't have a, a definite view on that. Um, I definitely, I mean, one thing that is that happens is that when something is taught very poorly, there's no sort of building up of the evidence going from the concrete to the abstract, that, that there's pretty much no other choice for someone who's expected to learn something than to just memorize it without understanding it. Whereas understanding will involve some memorization. I mean, you need to memorize those sound and letter correspondences, but then you have that in a conceptual framework and you're able to more easily reach up to higher knowledge. I mean, the whole kind of approach where there's no structure, no order, and then you have to take a test. I mean, just like in education as a whole, that requires a mindless sort of memorization where like no one's explained to you why the War of 1812 happened or mattered and you're just supposed to know like, oh, it was between the US and the English and it was fought in 1812 and like, so. The more general approach, I think, has to do with that. Okay, thank you. Hi, Sam. What advice would you give to that? Would you give to somebody who was uh, educated exclusively on tree queuing and on whole language to start learning and applying phonics consistently? You mean like as an adult in their yes. own reading? Yes. I, I mean, I think it would depend on where that person was in their their understanding of what's going on. I mean, it, it. I actually don't think it would hurt an adult to sort of go back to like some basic phonics exercises that uh, are given to children. You probably wouldn't spend as much time on them as, as children would. You, you pick them up more easily. Um, so I think like just stepping back and saying, these words are made up of letters. I'm learning how what letters correspond to what sounds, and I'm practicing piecing them together. The disadvantage that an adult has is that, uh, whereas a child may have habituated some bad habits for a year, two, or three, if you're an adult who has, is using bad methods, is using sort of guessing methods or kind of rote word memorization methods, you've been using them for a long time and you have them really automatized. So the, the work will probably be more in having to retrain how you approach reading. The other thing I, I would mention is that I really do think understanding a little bit about linguistics, not a graduate course, but understanding just some about how the English language is structured and how English spelling works um, is a good resource to have in your mind because it just helps you uh, understand the things you're seeing at a deeper level than if it's like, well, why is this word spelled that way and this word spelled another way? And who knows if you don't have some of the, uh, just some knowledge on why that is and some of the, the like background behind the scenes of English. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Sam. I think your uh, session really challenged some, some of my understanding, uh, but I want to clarify in some, some place. <laughs> so isn't uh, the whole language method uh, still the best for a market-based uh, capitalism-oriented uh, system out there? Uh, by deviating heavily from it, aren't we planting the seeds of immaturity and dependency on the whole population? Because I think, we're already seeing the adverse effects uh, of it uh, in the Western world, specifically in the form of wokeness. So, I'm sorry, what affects you? I didn't quite understand the middle part of the question. Right. Um, so, you know, by deviating from the whole language method, uh, aren't we planting the seeds of dependency and immaturity? Of dependency in, and immaturity? In the whole population, yes. No, I think it's, it's quite the reverse. If you, if you teach phonics, what you're teaching the children is to become independent because they're gaining the knowledge of how the language works. They've got the, the, you know, the basics of how they can now go on and decode any word that they encounter. So yeah, you're teaching them stuff in a classroom at the beginning of their lives, but now this is 
knowledge of how to read that they can use for the rest of their lives and that makes them independent. Whereas if you're using the whole language methods, uh, you're sort of, I mean, if someone really habituates those, it's like guessing and checking and like, how do you check what, whether a word says what you think it does? I mean, it often can come down to like some authority told you. The teacher said that it was this word. So I guess that's what it is. But if you don't have phonics, you have no way of like knowing that that's actually the word that it's supposed to be. So it's, it puts you in a state of de dependence. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, Sam. So if reading is foundational to being able to learn and being able to develop your skills of reason, then in your view, is there a relationship between um, the uptake of the whole word method and three queuing uh, and the rise of school violence? I don't want to venture an opinion on the, the causes of, of school violence. I think there's probably a lot of different factors involved, uh, some cultural, some intellectual, probably some educational. Um, but having not, having no expertise in like criminal psychology and things like that, and that being a pretty touchy issue, I don't, I don't really think I know enough to, to make a claim about causality. All right. Thank you. Hey, Sam. Uh, very interesting talk, actually. Um, I have a question, like most of us here, um, my first language is not English. Um, I learned, I, I'm from India, so I learned everything, like, you know, when growing up, I learned Tamil quite a bit, so I learned English in school. Um, so I have a close friend of mine, and when both of us sit down to read together, she reads much faster than I do. Um, and one of the things that I noticed about myself is I'm usually trying to convert what I'm reading into the language that I was born into. Mm -hmm. um, so, so my understanding gets better, right? So what role does phonics play in maybe eliminating that language conversion and understanding? Yeah, I, I think that's something, if I understand how you're describing it correctly, it's something that's happening later on than phonics. So what I was alluding to at one point is there's sort of the, these two main components in reading. There's decoding and there's comprehension. So decoding is just getting from the word off the page to the verbal word. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's comprehending. What does this word actually mean? I, I mean, think about this. Like, You could learn how to read words off the page in a language that you've never spoken before. I could teach you the sound system. Mm -hmm. And you could learn that probably fairly quickly. Okay. But what do the words mean? That's the hard part. That's uh, in terms of if you... If you're an adult and you're learning, you know enough about how letters and sounds work. Uh, so what you're describing is something that's more on the level of comprehension. How do I comprehend what these words mean? And there I have to defer because I don't know a lot about how second language learning works. And it sounds like there's a question of, is there a stage where you have to translate to your first language and then a stage where you start being able to like hold the meaning of that word yeah. in the second language. Yeah. Um, it's plausible to me that that's an important transitional phase, but I don't know enough about the subject to give you much insight. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you.